If you're a woman and sex is painful, one of the reasons might be that your pelvic floor muscles are very, very tight. It's a very common condition and it's called vaginismus. In today's podcast, we're exploring all the different aspects of vaginismus. I'm Dr. Neelima Deshpande, and this is V for Vagina, the podcast that dispels myths and misunderstandings about the vagina and empowers women to embrace their sexual energy, vitality, and well being. In this podcast, I'm accompanied by Niranjan Medekar, the CEO and founder of Sounds Great, the company that helps me create and market this podcast. Niranjan is an amazing creator, writer, columnist. And an author, and his podcast, Sex Ver Bold Bindas, which is showed on Storytel, is one of the most listened podcasts in Marathi. He's here today to help me sort through the hundreds of questions I've started to get on social media and as well as in response to the podcasts I've done here before. A lot of these questions are very personal, very intimate, and I needed help to sort them out. Thank you, Niranjan, for helping me to answer these questions. Thank you, ma'am. Here is the first question. What is vaginismus and how does it affect a relationship? Vaginismus is a condition that's present in women and it's associated with a strong and painful contraction that's involuntary of the pelvic floor muscles, which are at the entrance of the vagina. Women with vaginismus will often experience difficulty with inserting a finger inside their own vagina and it may, may or may not be associated with fear and discomfort. They may never have been able to use a tampon or a menstrual cup. And just the thought of experiencing penetration can put them off having sex altogether. Many men who are with women who suffer with vaginismus will often describe them as being fearful. Then the moment they start to approach the woman, she crosses her legs or completely keeps her thighs closed. Her body is very rigid. And she can often use her hands and her feet to push the man away, to avoid any kind of touch or entrance close to the vagina. Often it can mean that a man who is faced with this appearance of discomfort or pain or distress on a woman's face can get turned off. So he might find that he loses his erection really quickly. And sometimes also when men attempt penetration and the entrance to the vagina is really tightly closed, they can experience something called premature ejaculation or early ejaculation because of the anxiety of trying to perform uh, and not being able to penetrate and make the erection last long enough for penetration. And most of the time, both couples are ignorant about the fact that the vagina actually is not permitting entrance. It's not accommodating either the finger or the penis. Very rarely, this difficulty with penetration can be experienced by women who have either a sort of septum or who have a hymen that is what we call imperforate or is partially perforated. It's about the actual structure of the vagina and it's very rare, it's not common. But it also highlights the fact that if a couple is having difficulty with proceeding to intercourse and the marriage is unconsummated because both the man and the woman are experiencing fear or anxiety and the response that the man is getting or the woman is feeling is that she wants to cross her legs and tighten up and when the man attempts to penetrate, he feels like he's hitting a wall. It's really important to go and get examined so that this particular aspect can be ruled out. Because vaginismus by itself is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you want to rule out other problems before you make a diagnosis of vaginismus in someone. So this is this is what I would say to maybe some gynecologists or doctors who are listening to this podcast. And if you're a woman who's experiencing this problem, it's also important to get examined and you don't sit on the problem for years together thinking that you have to work hard at it or that there's something wrong with your relationship or there's something wrong with the man because he can't penetrate. No, it doesn't work like that. The vagina is an accommodator. It accommodates a finger, it can accommodate a penis, it can accommodate a baby's head. If the accommodation process is something that is making you feel challenged or difficult, it's better to help get help with it sooner rather than later. And you mentioned about involuntary contraction of pelvic floor muscles. So are you saying that many times women themselves are unaware about their suffering with vaginismus? 
Absolutely. Remember, this is also about upbringing. So men are more familiar with their genitals because genitals in men are visible. In women, genitals are hidden. And the tendency to explore genitals is also prohibited. A lot of the times women are told that it's dirty down there or they shouldn't explore themselves or, you know, there's a certain connotation about a woman who's willing to explore herself or masturbate. Even women who masturbate may accidentally find that stimulating the clitoris makes them experience pleasure, but they don't actually go ahead and explore where the vagina is. So unless they've been encouraged by their teachers or tutors by, or by a gynecologist to use a mirror to find out where their vagina is, where does the blood actually come from, then she doesn't actually know what her vulva or her vagina is. The assumption is everything's a vagina. Uh, everything's not the vagina. There is an external organ which is called the vulva, which is a complex of the mons pubis, the labia majora, the labia minora, the clitoris, the urethra, the introitus, and then leading to the entrance to the vagina, the perineum. So all of these are names of different parts of female genitalia that girls should be aware of and be taught to express themselves and speak about it without feeling shame or embarrassment. Mostly it's this shame and embarrassment about genitals that stops women and young girls from actually exploring themselves and being able to name different parts of their body so that they don't feel the inhibition, fear or anxiety when it comes to having sex with their partner. The other reason is also because, you know, if you consider culture and society, we're always told, oh, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to that boy. You're not allowed to go out with boys. Come home on time. This is typical messages that girls get. I want to see you home by seven o'clock. Don't stay out late. Don't go drinking. Don't do this. Don't do that. And girls are always taught that, oh my God, you know, uh, it's dangerous. Everything is da about men is dangerous. To be with a boy is dangerous. To talk to boys is dangerous. Getting involved is dangerous. Feeling aroused is dangerous. Feeling sexy is dangerous. Oh my God, you might end up becoming a prostitute if you feel sexy and aroused. And then what do they expect? They put two people together, get them married off, particularly in countries like India, where arranged marriages are still the norm. You're expected to suddenly become intimate with somebody you don't know much about. You've never had the experience of seeing a man undress himself. And then you're expected to undress yourself and submit to a process you have no understanding, information or experience of. So this is also responsible for why women are not familiar with their bodies and why vaginismus actually goes undiagnosed for a very long time. I know of many cases where the man has been blamed for being impotent because he's not been able to penetrate this woman. And the truth is, any man who is sensitive, gentle, understanding and caring will not be able to force himself on a partner who's experiencing pain or discomfort or is, is feeling terror or anxiety or fear at the prospect of having an intimate sexual encounter. And most men who are gentlemen will postpone this experience until the partner is ready. The trouble with vaginismus is because the fear is irrational. It's more like a phobia because the fear is irrational and because there is no scope for self-exploration, the woman may never get over her vaginismus, in which case sex, intimacy, conversations about sex, all of this can be put on the back burner. So ma'am, does vaginismus lead to fear of sex or does fear of sex already exist before vaginismus occurs? <laughs> the chicken before the egg. <laughs> it's a complex uh, issue. Certainly in many of the clients and patients I see, the fear of sex is already there before they go ahead and experience any kind of trouble with exploring themselves, trying to insert a tampon, or before they even come to know that they have some sort of inhibition about touching themselves or exploring their vagina. I had a patient quite early on in my career who described watching a film where the heroine in the film is raped. And uh, the way the scene was depicted was that she was screaming, she had her mouth covered, and there was blood all over the floor. I think this young girl may have been about eight or nine years old, and she then, very soon after watching this film, had her first period. And she did not tell her mother about this experience of bleeding because she thought, 
you know, something horrible had happened to her, like what had happened in the film. And that fear continued well into her 20s and 30s, where she wouldn't even agree to getting married or being with a partner because she was afraid that, you know, being with a man means that somebody's going to cover your mouth and force you to do something you don't want to do. And then the whole bedroom floor is going to be covered with blood and then you're going to die. So her fear was totally, totally consuming her mind and putting her in a situation where she's afraid of dying. Um, and this fear of death actually was one of the big reasons why she wasn't in a relationship for a very, very long time. The same kind of fear can be associated with the fear of pregnancy. For example, I had a young girl come to me uh, where she was about to be married. And she came to me saying, I'm really, really afraid of this first night because my elder sisters just had a baby. And I've seen her and I was there in the delivery room um, with her and with her husband. And she was screaming and shouting and hurling abuses at her husband. And I don't know, what did he do to her? What happened that this normally quiet and very self-controlled woman was transformed into this witch? who was hurling abuses and screaming in pain. And then when she had the baby and I saw the blood and the placenta and everything, I decided then that I was never, ever going to have a baby. Now, this conclusion for this young girl was really traumatic and she hadn't had this conversation with her partner. So when they started to plan for the wedding and started to talk about babies, she froze. And this man couldn't understand why this Previously, very engaging, soft-spoken, gentle, exciting woman suddenly froze and wouldn't allow him to get any closer to her. And of course, uh, this is a couple who had no understanding whatsoever about contraception and knowing that they could delay a pregnancy or plan for a baby when they wanted one. Right. So my next question is related to that only, that... Uh... What are some common factors in a current relationship that makes it difficult for couples to overcome this kind of sexual problem or overcome fear of sex? Many times uh, it's about culture and upbringing. So it's understanding that both the, if it's a heterosexual relationship, of course, uh, both the man and the woman have been brought up in different families with different backgrounds, with uh, different educations. May, they may or may not have had sex education. They may or may not have had great role models for conflict resolution in their families. And sex may be taboo. It may not be spoken about openly. Or like uh, the examples I mentioned earlier, there may have been certain instances in their past which predisposed them to this fear of having intercourse and this predisposition to tightening of the pelvic floor muscles and not allowing anything to enter them because they perceive it as something that's going to kill them. The fear is irrational. They can't verbalize it because, you know, talking about dying or death or something's going to kill me seems so ludicrous that they can't actually speak about it. They feel ashamed to actually have a problem like this, especially when their friends and, you know, their colleagues are having babies. I, mean, I had a couple recently who feel that their social life has been disrupted because they both grew up uh, in, in a particular school environment. They have lots of school friends and then later on they met and got married. And now they have this group of friends who've all got together, they're having kids and they're having meetups and this couple are having trouble with vaginismus and the man is having trouble with getting an erection and a baby is not immediately on the horizon. It's a sexual problem they can't actually talk about with their peers they feel excluded and unable to engage in a lot of social activities because eventually the conversation comes around to, oh, so when are you two going to have a baby? Are you having great sex? And what kind of sex do you have? And they can't entertain that kind of conversation. So many aspects of a couple's relationship, their ability to talk about the problem, their understanding of when's the right time to go and get help for it, which in my opinion should be sooner rather than later. Uh, their willingness to explore different avenues to solve their problems, being open to reading and discussing these issues, uh, makes their ability to seek help on time uh, a really crucial factor in how quickly this problem can be resolved. The longer they leave it, what's happening is that they're practicing their mistakes. They're practicing having painful sex or they're practicing not indulging in intimacy or they're practicing bad behavior relating to blame, shame, guilt or criticism where one or the other can't perform. That's very insightful, ma'am. So, ma'am, can vaginismus occur later in life or does it always happen with virgins? Actually, virginity and vaginismus are spoken in kind of the same line, but it's not true. 
the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of uh, Dysfunctions, talks about sexual dysfunctions occurring as a primary occurrence or a secondary occurrence, which means that primary occurrence is something that's been present at the beginning and secondary is something that happens following something else. So vaginismus also has a primary and a secondary component. So primary vaginismus is somebody who has difficulty having intercourse for the first time, who has difficulty inserting a tampon or a finger or a menstrual cup for the very first time, and there is a tightness of the pelvic floor muscles. But the same reaction can also happen in somebody, say, who has had intercourse successfully once or twice or many times before, and then something happens to cause the pelvic floor to become tight and reactive. For example, I had a client who developed recurrent vaginal infections, and the dryness and pain associated with those vaginal infections made sex so uncomfortable that she developed secondary vaginismus, in which case the pelvic floor became really tight and uncomfortable and the couple weren't able to enjoy intercourse at all and therefore then their intimacy suffered and they stopped engaging in intercourse for long periods of time. Vaginismus can be something that happens soon after a vaginal delivery, especially if the vaginal delivery has been traumatic, either a forceps or a ventus or an episiotomy or maybe sometimes even um, fourth degree tear. Any of these conditions where surgery is required, whether there are stitches, there's pain, discomfort, inflammation or infection, can result in vaginismus afterwards where the pelvic floor muscle goes into a spasm and sex becomes painful and uncomfortable. Another condition can be, say, later on in life where there's vaginal surgery, maybe, say, for prolapse or, again, you know, as the woman goes through menopause, there is extreme dryness, tightness, burning, pain, discomfort, and the pelvic floor automatically tightens up and prevents intercourse from happening. So vaginismus can happen later on in life. It's not necessarily something that's associated with virginity. Ma'am, can vaginismus be overcome just with arousal? Vaginismus has grades. So, it can go from mild to very severe. And one of the most severe cases of vaginismus I've seen is where the woman actually came to see me. And she refused to even get on the couch to be examined because the thought of someone approaching her genitals was absolutely inconceivable to her. Now remember, there's another grade of severity of the women who don't even come to a gynecologist. <laughs> so the women actually show up in a gynecologist clinic at the tip of the iceberg. Even in this tip of the iceberg, there's a range. Then there's the next woman who actually gets onto the couch and is willing to be assessed and examined. But as soon as I start to approach her genitals, she closes her thighs and refuses to, refuses to be touched. And then the next grade is somebody who actually allows me to touch the outside of her genitals, but cannot or will not permit a finger to be inserted. And then the next grade is where I can barely get the tip of my finger in or one finger in, but the pelvic floor muscles are able to tighten and relax. And she is also able to insert a finger, barely insert a finger. It's still uncomfortable. And then the easiest type of vaginismus is one where the woman says, okay, fine. And she's able to view her vulva in the mirror. She's able to insert her own finger and actually... She doesn't feel any pain or discomfort. She's able to move her pelvic floor easily. And in the clinic, she's also able to insert two of her own fingers. So these are different grades of vaginismus. And the milder the grade, the more easy it is to overcome with arousal. Arousal is important in all cases of vaginismus simply to bring about the association of pleasure with overcoming this problem of tight pelvic floor muscles, which has to be done in a gradual way in a variety of different kinds of techniques, overcoming the conditioning of fear and phobia, over, overcoming the condition of sensitivity to touch, the anticipation of pain, the psychology around pain and discomfort and what the woman should or shouldn't tolerate. All of these are factors which then have to be dealt with before arousal can actually make a difference. So remember that in, in the neural pathways, that connect the brain and the body, pain, fear, anxiety, anger, these are blocks. So they stop the arousal process from actually happening effectively. So most of the work in sex therapy actually goes to uh, modeling and remodeling and reviewing the fear anxiety cycle and gradually diminishing it and then including arousal as part of the treatment process, which can, as the fear and anxiety lessen, finally enable the woman to overcome it and engage in 
intimacy and intercourse thank you ma'am for explaining in detail that vaginismus is not the same for every woman but it differs from person to person ma'am the next question is what difference does the partner make in a person who is suffering with vaginismus wow this is such an important question the partner is suffering in his own way it is the ultimate rejection for a man who has an erection who finds his wife or his partner extremely arousing and excited but is unable or is not permitted to complete the act it depends on how that person interprets that particular experience if it's interpreted in a negative way he can use it as a judgment against himself and beat himself about it and then it will affect his ability to get aroused and get an erection the next time around his reaction can be of anger of uh, impatience of blame shame guilt and criticism of the woman for not allowing him to perform or it can be one of submission where he says oh my god what have i done to you my god you know i caused you so much pain blah 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 you know i'm so terrible and going totally in his shell and not even approaching the woman the next time there is a happy medium of course of male partners who are concerned who are gentle and who want to explore the situation with their female partner and in the these are often the men who will actually encourage uh, their partners to seek help and they will also accompany these women and understand from the doctor that even vaginismus even though it's showing up as a problem in the female partner it's a problem of the relationship it's not just a problem of one person and the solution lies in both of them working together many couples i've met they send the wife you know for treatment go get yourself fixed and the man doesn't show up and more often than that there is a significant communication issue happening in the background between the man and the woman this concept about blame shame guilt criticism putting the woman down for not performing for not being a great wife is not going to contribute to having vaginismus solved the more relaxed the woman is the more accepted she is the more she is able to inhabit her body and her arousal and her sexuality the more likely it is that vaginismus can be overcome with the partner's help the partner that i see in couples where vaginismus is resolved is one who is open to exploration is curious about what the problem is and willing to modify and change how they interact with each other it's a partner who's willing to seek help and understand that it's not about him or her it's about their goal together of achieving intimacy and intercourse the way they want rather than being given a score out of 10 for performance because neither vaginismus nor erectile dysfunction nor early ejaculation is about performance it's about having a mutually satisfying intimate sexual experience so you can see that there's a range in how the male partner can show up in vaginismus and i have several clients where the solution for them has ended up in a divorce because the woman is too afraid or too frightened or unable to engage and she's been blamed for not being able to service the partner and um the man has accepted that as an explanation and the relationship has ended because they allowed the problem to become bitter and angry and resentful between them and then the opposite has been the couple who have had the problem for many many years but they've had a great relationship they haven't blamed each other they've understood that life circumstances got in the way they didn't end up having any kids but they found time in their 40s you know when all the life situations had been handled parents illness you know the brothers divorce the company's loss financial issues when all of this got resolved they did find the time to come for therapy and the vaginismus and the erectile dysfunction was resolved really quickly and they got on and they had a great intimate sexual relationship but that only enhanced their already existing good relationship it enhanced their communication with each other they and it enhanced their love for each other and this can happen at any stage I mean I do say that it's better to get treated earlier rather than later but whatever is the right time for them is the right time for them if if they have a problem is better to show up sooner rather than later 
But sometimes uh, the circumstances may not be right for them to have therapy. It's always better to make a decision in conjunction with the therapist. So if it's not the right time, then you know they can come back later. But having a partner who's willing to engage is actually one of the most critical factors in uh, how vaginismus gets solved. Thank you, ma'am. That's very informative. And after the role of partner, now the question is about role of treatment. So do all patients with vaginismus need medical treatment or surgery? This is also an interesting question and it ties in with that question about the grades of vaginismus. You know, but do all women experience vaginismus in the same way? Typically, if a couple has not been able to resolve their sexual problem by themselves over a period of six months, you know, with their own kind of self-help and it started to affect their relationship, they need help. The help may be in the form of counseling. It may be in the form of cognitive behavioral therapy with examination. It may be as a part of psychosexual therapy. It may be as a part of couples therapy with communication and exploring the couple's sexual needs and preferences. Very, very rarely, you know, like the example I told you about where the vagina had a septum or the hymen was imperforate. This may require surgery. Very, very rarely in very advanced cases of vaginismus, there's also a procedure called Botox, uh, which we offer to women, which paralyzes some of the elements of the pelvic floor muscles that are causing tightness and pain and discomfort. But it's important to remember that this assessment for surgery needs to happen in the doctor's clinic and it can take some time, depending on how comfortable the woman is to be examined. If she's experienced a lot of pain before she comes to the doctor, she may not even allow an examination. In which case, sometimes it's necessary to examine the woman under an anesthetic to make this discovery of a septum or an imperfect hymen. Sometimes it's very difficult to make this diagnosis in a clinic because the patient won't allow it because of their fear. In which case, this assessment may need to be done under an anesthetic. Also, if the man has a simultaneous problem with a very tight prepuce where skin doesn't retract easily, where ejaculation is happening too soon or the erection is not maintaining itself, then even a patient with mild vaginismus, will, the, this couple will not be able to consummate their marriage because uh, there's a problem with both the man and the woman, in which case then treatment for the male may involve something like circumcision. It may involve some treatment for erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. So. These therapeutic processes that happen as part of sex therapy and outside sex therapy in gynecology, urology, andrology, etc., they are iterative, which means that we always begin with the least invasive process, counseling, speaking, where examination and assessment is part of that process. And then we go step by step, step by step to then determine whether the next level of treatment is actually required or not. So to then answer your question briefly is that no, not all women with vaginismus require the same treatment. They don't require the same kind of counseling. They don't require surgery or medication in the same way. It depends on the assessment of that particular individual as well as of the couple. And I think it's important to remember that the man also needs to be examined and assessed. Right, right. As you previously said that many women who are suffering with vaginismus, their partners may have uh, erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. So I hope you've gathered a lot of information about vaginismus, painful sex, about difficulties with penetration and intercourse, and that this podcast has been very enlightening and informative. And if you're someone who's suffering with difficulty with having intercourse, that you will go and get assessed sooner rather than later. Like I said, don't practice your mistakes. Don't practice having painful intercourse, don't practice the mistakes that lead to painful intercourse. Get treatment sooner rather than later. Get assessed and um, resolve this issue once and for all. Thank you. Remember to like, subscribe and share this podcast with whoever you think needs to hear it. If you'd like to talk to me one-on-one -on -one for a personal consultation, get in touch with me via my website www.drdr.com Nilima, N double E L I M A, Deshpande, D E S H P A N D E dot com. And you'll find a button there where you can click and book a slot with me. And I'll be sure to respond to any of your queries. Thank you. Disclaimer This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. 
The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's or listener's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Thank you.